and welcome to Liberty Me Live. We're here tonight with Dr. Michael Humer. Dr. Humer is a professor of philosophy at University of Colorado Boulder. He's a proponent of ethical intuitionism and kind of introduced the anarcho-capitalist world to that in a book last year uh, entitled The Problem of Political Authority, which has been kind of all the rage in some of our circles uh, over the last uh, last year or so, or actually, I guess almost two years now. That's, uh, it's been longer than I thought. But anyway, tonight he's going to be talking about uh, the ethics of unjust legal advocacy. Should you, uh, if as a lawyer, and I speak as someone who's legally trained, uh, should you represent somebody you know is guilty? And so he's going to talk about that. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to him. All right, thank you. Yes, yeah, so the ethics of unjust legal advocacy. So you can see my little picture of unjust legal advocacy in the corner there. That's Johnny Cochran trying on the glove. Uh, so I start with, start with this scenario, and this should pose an ethical problem. Suppose you have a friend who is a serial murderer. Your friend confesses this to you one day and um, asks you to keep this secret and even to give him advice on how he can evade the police and avoid being punished for his crimes. Um, what should you do? <clears throat> now, suppose that you decide to help your friend get away with his crimes. What would be the moral assessment of this? And I take it that any normal person would say, well, this would be extremely wrong. It would be horribly wrong, maybe not as bad as actually murdering people, but <clears throat> it's really not a whole lot better. Um, because by helping this person get away with murder, you're um, incurring the possibility that he's going to murder more people in the future. So here's a question. Uh, why does it matter if the person who's helping the murderer is a lawyer? On the face of it, it might seem like the lawyer is doing the same thing as the friend in this example. And thus, you might wonder, why is the lawyer's action not, not horribly wrong uh, when a lawyer attempts to enable a criminal to get away with his crimes. All right, now um, just as background, so these are uh, some terms that I'm using. So unjust advocacy is pursuing a legal outcome that you know to be unjust. Now, one example of that is trying to help a murderer get acquitted, but there can be other cases. So it could be a civil case in which you're pursuing a lawsuit where you believe that the plaintiff is in the wrong, or it could be you're defending against a lawsuit where you think the plaintiff is in the right, uh, or it could, could also be a prosecuting attorney who is prosecuting somebody for something that they should not be prosecute, prosecuted for. So uh, in whatever way, uh, lawyers frequently advocate for outcomes that would appear to be unjust. <laughs> now, the standard view in the legal profession is that it's permissible or perhaps even obligatory for a lawyer to engage in this unjust advocacy if it is in the best interests of his client. So I refer to this view as devil's advocacy for uh, perhaps obvious reasons. <laughs> okay, but also <clears throat> here's a moral principle that I think is plausible. At least prima facie, it's wrong to cause or allow injustice. So obviously there's a tension between the duty of justice the duty not to cause or allow injustice, and the devil's advocacy position. And so that creates the philosophical problem that I want to talk about. All right, now, so this is an expression of the devil's advocacy view. This is the court's opinion in the case of United States versus Wade in 1967. The judge wrote, defense counsel has no obligation to ascertain or present the truth. He must be and is interested in preventing conviction of the innocent, but absent a voluntary plea of guilty, we also insist that he defend his client whether he is innocent or guilty. The state has the obligation to present the evidence. Defense counsel need present nothing, even if he knows what the truth is. He need not furnish any witnesses to the police or reveal any confidences of his client or furnish any other information to help the prosecution's case. If he can confuse a witness, even a truthful one, or make him appear at a disadvantage, unsure or, or indecisive, that will be his normal course. 
right? Now, I take it that in this last sentence, the judge is suggesting when he says that will be his normal course, that that would be an appropriate and morally acceptable course of action. So why should we believe this position? On the face of it, it seems like there's an obvious reason why you should not behave in that way, namely that you may be causing injustice to occur. So I'm gonna talk about reasons that people offer for this position, for the devil's advocacy position. Uh, first, it's frequently said that the lawyer in this case is simply doing his job. It's just the job of the lawyer to defend his client. <laughs> right, so, um, and even if the client's interests are unjust, it's still your job to pursue those interests. So my response to this is, if an action is normally morally wrong, the introduction of employment opportunities for people who undertake that action does not render an otherwise immoral action moral. So um, here's another example that's a, analogous, I think. Um, suppose that there's a hitman and you're asking him, you know, why are you murdering people? And the hitman says, well, it's just my job. So it's true that if you're not willing to commit murder, then you have no business being an assassin. Uh, and it is the job of an assassin to commit murder. However, that does nothing whatsoever to explain why it's permissible for an assassin to murder people. Um, in fact, it's not permissible. Uh, so similarly, may be true that if you're not willing to engage in unjust advocacy, then you have no business being a lawyer, but that does nothing whatsoever to explain why unjust advocacy would be permissible. Okay, here's a second thing that's sometimes said. Uh, sometimes it's said that, well, look, we have a good criminal justice system, a good justice system in general. And if everybody plays their assigned role in the system, then it will produce the correct outcome. So provided that uh, the prosecuting attorney and the defense attorney are both doing their best um, according to the roles assigned to them, justice will prevail. <laughs> All right, now this might be true in the majority of cases, uh, we should hope, <laughs> but uh, to, to assume that that will always be true is just an unjustified faith in the system. There are many reasons why the system can fail and you can get an unjust outcome. So for example, it could be that um, you have information that the other side doesn't have. So for example, the defense attorney could know facts that the prosecutor doesn't know and that establish the guilt of the defendant. Um, people can be affected by emotions and biases. The people on the jury or the judge could be affected by biases. Um, one lawyer could just be more skillful than the other lawyer, and there could just be flaws in the legal system. Um, and so there are many reasons why there can be injustice, even if you play your assigned role in the system. And you can frequently be justified in believing that such an injustice is about to occur uh, if you undertake unjust advocacy. All right, so a third thing that's commonly said, <laughs> this might be the favorite explanation for devil's advocacy. Um, <clears throat> it's sometimes thought that the way you should behave is not determined by <clears throat> um, what will produce the best consequences in the individual case that you're in, but rather what rules would produce the best consequences if they were generally followed. And then, so you should try to figure out what rules produce, produce the best consequences, and then you should act according to those rules, even in the individual cases where acting <laughs> according to the rules does not produce the best consequences. Okay, and then it's sometimes suggested that if everybody accepts devil's advocacy and they all act according to this rule, then there will be better consequences in the justice system as a whole. And that might be true even if in some individual cases it produces undesirable consequences, right? And so the conclusion is that you should accept devil's advocacy and you should engage in unjust advocacy when that is required by your role in the system. So what do I think about this? Uh, the first thing to point out about this is, so the assumed moral theory here of rule consequentialism is highly controversial. This is very far from accepted doctrine in ethics. There are some people who hold this view. There are many people who reject this view. Um, it's unclear on the face of it why you should care what the results are of everybody following a given rule, given that you can't cause it to be the case that everybody is following that rule in general. You can only cause it to be the case that you follow the rule right now. 
Um, there's also an argument in the literature that actually rule consequentialism collapses into act consequentialism. Um, if, you, uh, if you allow rules to contain exceptions, then you can always um, add in exceptions for every case in which the rule does not actually produce the best consequences. You can have an exception that says you don't have to follow the rule in that case. If you allow such exceptions, then actually rule consequentialism just turns into act consequentialism. Um, and then the result is that you just do what produces the best consequences in the individual case. If you don't allow exceptions, um, then I think you just have an absurd moral theory. So for example, it's completely implausible to hold that nobody should ever kill anyone. Um, what might be plausible is you shouldn't kill anyone except in self-defense or in defense of an innocent third party, or if the person is being punished for a very serious crime of which they were duly convicted, et cetera. So it looks like you have to allow in some exceptions. And if you allow in as many exceptions as you want, then at, um, rural consequentialism just turns into act consequentialism. Um, finally, rural consequentialism might have absurd implications. For example, it might imply that it's morally wrong to be a philosophy professor, because if everybody all the time followed the rule, become a philosophy professor, it would have terrible consequences. Okay, second thing to say is, even if you accept rural consequentialism, it's still completely unclear why we should think that it would be bad if everybody pursued justice in the justice system. Why would there be better consequences if people follow the rule of always pursuing the interests of their client rather than following the rule of always pursuing justice? Now, you might think maybe the concern is, well, um, look, if everybody always pursues justice, more people are going to be convicted. Um, there are a lot of guilty defendants who want to plead not guilty. Now, if these defendants are actually guilty, then the result that they get convicted because their defense attorney is not willing to enter a not guilty plea is the correct result. That would not be a bad result. Like we want guilty people to be convicted. So I guess it would have to be the concern is that there are some innocent people who are going to be wrongly convicted as a result of everyone pursuing justice. Okay, now the thought might be, <clears throat> there are some innocent people who appear guilty and then defense attorneys will be unwilling to represent those people and then they're going to be convicted. Um, but <clears throat> this seems to me kind of a far-fetched concern, uh, mostly because defense attorneys tend to be very strongly biased in favor of defendants. So I think that if you have a defendant for whom no defense attorney thinks that there's a reasonable doubt about whether that person is guilty, I think that fact alone is pretty close to a proof that the person is guilty. Now, obviously our concern in the justice system can't be that no innocent person ever gets convicted because if that's your goal, you have to completely dismantle the entire system because there's no way of having a criminal justice system in which no innocent people are ever convicted. Um, as long as anyone is ever convicted, sometimes innocent people will be convicted. So the goal would have to be to reduce the probability of an innocent person being convicted, okay? But if we accept that uh, it's okay to convict a person when a jury judges that their guilt was proved beyond a reasonable doubt, um, it should also be okay for a person to be convicted as a result of the fact that no defense attorney thinks that there's a reasonable doubt about whether they're guilty, right? Okay, so third, the third concern you might have is, well, maybe there are some guilty parties who uh, should be punished, but even if you're guilty, you still have some rights. So it is possible for the state to violate the rights of a guilty person, for example, by over punishing them or so punishing them more than they deserve or giving them a kind of punishment that is inappropriate. Um, and so even if a person is guilty, they might require legal representation to protect their legitimate rights. Okay, and now here the response to this concern is, um, I'm not saying that it's unethical for a defense attorney to, to represent a person who he thinks is guilty. I'm saying it's unethical for a defense attorney or any attorney to advocate for injustice, to advocate for something that he himself regards as unjust. 
So it's not unethical to attempt to defend the legitimate rights of a defendant, whether that defendant is guilty or not. Right. So I'm not saying that you have to um, that lawyers have to not represent anyone who's guilty at all. They can represent a guilty party and attempt to prevent that person from being over punished, for example. OK, now, what are the arguments against unjust advocacy? So the first argument, which I've suggested already, is pretty straightforward. Uh, it seems like, on the face of it, prima facie, it's wrong to knowingly pursue injustice. And that's illustrated by the example that I had at the beginning. Uh, if, you, if you have a friend and you know that the friend is a serial murderer, you know, he just confessed to you that he's killed several people, uh, it would be morally wrong for you to sit back and do nothing about it. It would be even worse for you to actively assist the person in getting away with a crime. And the reason for that is, well, you're causing an unjust outcome to occur that a guilty person doesn't get punished. And of course, more crimes are probably going to occur in the future. Um, so just on the face of it, you would think that it's wrong to knowingly try to bring about an outcome that you think is unjust. Um, it's really hard to see how this could not be the case. It would be really strange for someone to say, no, the fact that an outcome is unjust is no reason not to pursue it. Right? Um, and it seems like there are no special circumstances that would override this prima facie wrongness in the case of a lawyer representing a client. And the reason I say that is because of the arguments I just gave previously, that the things that are commonly said to defend devil's advocacy don't seem like very good arguments. Uh, so the conclusion is unjust legal advocacy is morally wrong. Okay, now I have a second argument against unjust advocacy. Um, second argument, so the first premise here is something that is already widely accepted in conventional legal ethics. Uh, it's widely accepted that it's morally wrong for a lawyer to explicitly lie in court or lie to the court. It's wrong to suborn perjury. Uh, so in other words, it's considered morally wrong for a lawyer to um, elicit from a witness perjury that he, the lawyer, knows to be false, right? If you think that somebody is going to lie in response to a particular question, you're supposed to not ask that question. Um, it's also considered unethical for a lawyer to introduce falsified evidence. So if you know that your client um, has produced some evidence, so say the client has produced a document um, which is falsified evidence, right? It claims to be a document created by someone else, but actually you know that it's a forgery that was produced by your client. Uh, it's considered unethical to introduce that evidence, right? So, uh, and this is widely accepted already. This is not just something that I'm saying. This is something that's accepted in the legal profession. But it seems to me that the practice of unjust advocacy in general is not morally superior to lying, suborning perjury, or introducing falsified evidence. Okay, so think about why we think that it's wrong for the lawyer to lie or suborn perjury or introduce falsified evidence. Um, well, first of all, it's typically wrong just in general to tell lies. Uh, but it's particularly wrong in the legal context because um, it's a lie that is going to undermine the ability of the court to satisfy its function of determining the truth so that justice can be done. So it's a particularly serious to lie to the court because it prevents the court from doing justice as it's supposed to. Okay, so if that's wrong, if that's why it's wrong for a lawyer to lie to the court, um, how would it be any better for a lawyer to advocate, just outright advocate for an outcome that he knows to be unjust? Um, it seems like. Um, so the reason why lying to the court is wrong is that it tends to cause a certain outcome. So it must be wrong to just deliberately, explicitly attempt to bring about that outcome. Okay, and the other thing to say is actually unjust advocacy kind of is lying. So it's considered wrong for a lawyer to lie about an objective matter of fact. But when you engage in unjust advocacy, you are intentionally attempting to mislead the court as to how the case should be decided. The court is attempting to give the, the correct resolution of the case. If you're engaging in unjust advocacy, you're trying to mislead them about what's the correct resolution of the case. 
Um, and the whole point about why you shouldn't lie about factual matters is that it would mislead the court about how they should resolve the case. So it must be wrong to just deliberately mislead them about how, to, how they should resolve the case. Okay, so it seems like unjust legal advocacy is wrong. <laughs> okay, this is stuff that I already said. Um, now, this point, this is a point that I meant to mention. Um, it's not just that explicitly lying to people is wrong, intentionally misleading people is also wrong. So uh, here's an example that I have. Um, <laughs> so let's say, so I'm a professor. Let's say that I've been asked to write a letter for somebody's tenure review. So there's another professor who is being reviewed uh, for, for being awarded tenure, and I'm supposed to write a letter about this person. And let's say I write in my letter, uh, Professor X is a drunk. And uh, he frequently comes to class drunk, so you shouldn't give him tenure. Um, suppose that, in fact, that's false, and I know that that's false. <laughs> so obviously, it would be wrong for me to do this. Okay, now imagine a slightly different case. Um, instead of saying that, I write a letter and I say, Professor X's drinking problem is not a good reason for denying him tenure because he comes to class sober at least 80% of the time. All right, so that's, that's, what, that's my comment. <laughs> Um, and suppose that, in fact, that is literally true, because uh, the per Professor X actually does not have a drinking problem at all and is actually sober 100% of the time. So then what I said is literally true. It's true that his drinking problem isn't a reason to deny tenure because he doesn't have a drinking problem. And it's true that he's sober at least 80% of the time because he's sober 100% of the time. But obviously, it would be wrong for me to write that in the letter. Right? It would be morally wrong because I'm intentionally misleading people, even though what I said was literally true, right? So the sort of things that a lawyer would do to attempt to bring about the unjust outcome might not be outright lying, but they would be attempting to mislead people. So um, in my example of writing this letter about Professor X, um, I'm attempting to induce the, the reader of the letter to make mistaken inferences. Um, and that's exactly the sort of thing that the lawyer would be doing. So it's, I mean, generally speaking, it's not morally superior to intentionally induce people to make false inferences than it is to simply say the false thing. Okay. Um, and unjust advocacy is deception in the pursuit of injustice in particular, which makes it worse than most deception. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some implications of this view. Um, down in the corner there, that's a picture of Jack Kevorkian, um, who was twice acquitted on charges of assisted suicide. In fact, I think three times. Um, and it was clear that he had done it. He had actually assisted people in committing suicide. Uh, but he was acquitted three times, probably because the jury sympathized with his cause. Okay, so uh, question. According to my view, is it wrong to defend anyone who is apparently guilty? Um, not necessarily. So first, as I mentioned earlier, guilty clients do have rights and legitimate interests, uh, which it is not unjust to defend. Um, <clears throat> second, there are some laws that are actually unjust, and that's why I bring up the case of Kevorkian. The law against assisted suicide was in fact unjust. So attempting to get Kevorkian acquitted of that charge was not unjust advocacy. That would have been just advocacy because for him to be convicted was unjust because the law itself was unjust. Um, also, there are some punishments that are simply excessive, um, even if you think that the law is not unjust per se. So um, even if you believe that it's okay to prohibit drugs, for example, uh, many of the punishments that people give for drug use are still um, excessive, right? So if you think that convicting somebody of a crime of which they're guilty is going to result in their being punished more than they deserve, um, it might be that the excessive punishment is a greater un injustice than the person not being punished at all. If you think that, then attempting to get the person acquitted would not be unjust advocacy. That would actually be perfectly just. Right. So uh, this is to clarify what I am in, and am not saying. Right. I'm not saying that it's always wrong to defend people who are guilty of violating the law. I'm just saying it's wrong to try to bring about injustice. Okay. Um, Second question, if you have 
So if a lawyer has the policy that they never advocate for unjust outcomes, do they have to disclose that to their clients? Um, and I would say here, <laughs> I would say here the answer is yes. So uh, if you are a lawyer, you should tell your clients at the beginning that you're going to refuse to advocate for any position that you yourself regard as being unjust. Now, admittedly, that might result in your losing most of your clients. Um, in the case of criminal defense attorneys, the vast majority of their clients are in fact guilty, uh, and many of them probably want you to help them try to evade justice, so uh, they might leave you and go to another client. Okay, now, uh, why do I say that the lawyer would have a, this duty to disclose his policy? <laughs> um, so, although it's wrong to advocate for unjust outcomes, it's also wrong to defraud your clients. And basically, the devil's advocacy position is so widespread, it's so well known in our society that this is what lawyers think their job is, that any client is going to assume that that's your view as well, unless you tell them otherwise. So if you accept a client, um, you're pretty much if you accept a client without telling them that your policy is never to advocate for unjust outcomes, um, you're pretty much falsely implying to the client that you will advocate for their interests regardless of whether they're just or unjust, because that's just the understanding in our society of what lawyers do. Okay, so uh, although it, it would be correct to try to get a guilty person punished justly, um, it would not be correct to take their money under false pretenses. Okay, so that's the stuff that I just said. Um, what about this? <laughs> so uh, many lawyers have a practice of attempting to avoid knowing that their client is guilty so that they can go on to defend that client, quote, in good conscience. So uh, lawyers will often try to discourage the client from confessing or from saying anything incriminating because that will make the lawyer uncomfortable and will uh, perhaps prevent the lawyer from making as effective a defense as he could because he's not allowed to explicitly lie. All right, so what do we think about this policy? Is it morally permissible to simply attempt to avoid knowing whether your client is guilty or not? Um, so I think the answer is no. Actually, this only makes the problem worse, right? Um, Sorry, go back for a second. Uh, it only makes the lawyer even more guilty. So here's another hypothetical example that I have. Um, let's say I'm driving along the street and I'm about to turn onto Mapleton Avenue and I'm concerned that there might be some children playing in the street. If there are some children playing in the street, I would have to stop uh, in order to avoid running them over. And I don't want to stop. I want to just be able to keep driving. Um, but it would be morally wrong for me to just drive the children. So what I do is I close my eyes as I turn the corner so I won't know whether there are any children playing the street. Okay, so now have I avoided culpability? Um, obviously not, right? Uh, if it turns out that there are some children playing in the street and I run them over as a result of the fact that I couldn't see them because I closed my eyes, uh, I will be guilty. Of, I will be to blame for their deaths. Okay, so this is like what the lawyer is doing if he tries to avoid finding out whether his client is guilty. Um, in fact, if you know that you're about to do something which might have terrible consequences, uh, it's impermissible to try to avoid finding out whether it will have those consequences. In fact, typically you're obligated to positively try to find out whether it has those consequences. So you'd be obligated to, you know, make, to look to make sure that there aren't any children playing in the street. Uh, similarly, it looks like the lawyer would have some obligation to actually attempt to find out what the just outcome would be. Uh, for example, if he's a defense attorney, to find out whether his client is guilty or not. Um, now, there's some limit to how much you can expect people to do, but you know, at in the case of the children playing in the street, at minimum, you can expect the, the driver to look and see. So you might think the lawyer should at minimum ask the client whether the client is guilty. Um, certainly, he shouldn't try to discourage the client from confessing. Okay, um, now one thing that I haven't emphasized yet, so most of this discussion um, is phrased as if we're talking about a defense attorney. 
defending a guilty client. And uh, that is probably the majority of cases of unjust advocacy because uh, the vast majority of people who are put on trial are guilty. Um, but this lesson also applies to prosecuting attorneys. Unjust advocacy can certainly happen for prosecuting attorneys just as much as for defense attorneys. Um, and in fact, it might be a more serious problem. So uh, the picture in the corner there is Mike Nafong. He was the prosecutor in the Duke lacrosse case. Uh, he got in trouble basically because he was um, apparently deliberately prosecuting innocent people. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'm going to continue my presentation, hopefully, about where I left off before I got cut off. So I was talking about how um, prosecutors can engage in unjust advocacy. Um, and so there, there are three ways in which a punishment can be unjust. Um, that is, if the defendant actually didn't do what he was accused of, or he did what he's accused of, but it's not wrong, and therefore it shouldn't be punished, or... Um, <clears throat> He did something and it is wrong, but the punishment that is going that he's going to get if he's convicted is more than they deserve. So it could be a disproportionate punishment. Uh, an example is sometimes under these three strikes laws, somebody can get an extremely harsh punishment. So let's say you're you're convicted of your third drug offense and you go to prison for 20 years, right? And even people who who think drug prohibition is okay would probably agree that that was a disproportionate punishment. Right. So um, it would be unjust and morally wrong for a prosecutor to attempt to get somebody punished in these ways. Right now, so as I said, the first of these, um, trying to get somebody punished who is factually innocent is generally condemned. But any kind of unjust punishment, um, attempting to get any kind of unjust punishment is a kind of wrongful unjust advocacy. Um, Somebody being punished for an action that is not wrong is equally unjust as being punished for an action that they didn't perform. So it's unclear why it would be considered morally acceptable to advocate for the one kind of punishment, but not acceptable to advocate for the other kind. So if you accept that it's wrong to attempt to punish people who are factually innocent, you should also accept it's wrong to attempt to punish people for things that aren't morally wrong. Okay, and I, I do want to emphasize the point that the unjust advocacy on the part of prosecuting attorneys is actually much worse than unjust advocacy on the part of defense attorneys. The reason for that is I think it's much worse for, uh, it's much worse to punish somebody wrongly than it is to merely fail to punish someone justly. Right? Unjust punishment is worse than a mere absence of just punishment. Um, and typically we think it's much worse, which is why. Um, we have a burden of proof in criminal trials and we try to make it very difficult for innocent people to be convicted. Okay, now um, another issue, well, what would be my view about public policy questions? So if I think that unjust advocacy is morally wrong, do I think that it should be legally prohibited? Um, there the answer is no. I'm not, I'm not addressing a legal question about what should or shouldn't be legal. I'm just addressing a moral question. The question is, if you are a lawyer, how morally ought you to behave? Um, the reason I don't think it should be legally prescribed is that um, even if you think that somebody is innocent, you might still think that the state will judge that person to be guilty. And therefore, a lawyer defending a client who he, the lawyer, thinks is innocent would be taking a risk. If defending guilty people was illegal, the lawyer would be taking a risk that he's going to be punished because the state will disagree with him about who was guilty. Um, even if the rule just said, well, um, you can't defend people who you yourself know to be innocent, um, a lawyer might still doubt whether the state is going to claim that the lawyer knew the client was guilty. Right. So it might be that even if you think the person is innocent, you might still worry that the state might claim that you knew that he was guilty and therefore you might be prosecuted. And we don't want um, we don't want the lawyers to have to worry about that. We don't want them to be deterred from defending people who they think are innocent. All right. So that's why there shouldn't really be a law against this. All right. So now concluding thoughts. 
Um, it seems to me that the burden of proof is on the devil's advocates, the people who think that it's okay to advocate for an unjust outcome. Um, they should give some reason why that's okay, because just on the face of it, it's normally wrong to actively pursue injustice. Um, and it turns out that when you look at the arguments that are given for why it's okay or even desirable for a lawyer to advocate for unjust outcomes, if they're in the interest of his client, uh, it turns out that th those arguments are amazingly weak. Um, now, why does the legal profession accept this view? Well, here's a hypothesis. It might be because it's in the interests of the legal profession, right? So uh, here's some, um, you know, just notes about what is considered ethical according to the American Bar Association. So they have a document called the Model Rules of Professional Conduct. This is um, produced, so the American Bar Association is the big professional association of lawyers. And according to them, uh, it is considered unethical to violate attorney-client confidentiality, even if um, that would be necessary to prevent a violent criminal from going free. So um, for example, your client has confessed to you that he's guilty, it would be unethical to reveal that or to reveal any of the client's secrets, um, you know, even if revealing them would be necessary to prevent um, a horrible criminal from going free and possibly committing more crimes. However, according to the ABA, it is ethically permissible to violate attorney-client confidentiality if doing so is necessary to collect your fee. So if you have a dispute with your client and he's trying to not pay you, if somehow violating confidentiality enables you to get the money that he owes you, then you can do it. Can it be that it's morally more important for lawyers to get paid than it is for violent criminals to be imprisoned. Um, here's another hypothesis. You know, maybe the reason why the ABA has these rules is actually the the ethical rules of the ABA are designed for the benefit of lawyers. Um, obviously, it would be in a lawyer's interest if he can promise to his client that he's going to serve the client's interests regardless of justice. If you have to say to your client, look, I'm not going to advocate for anything that I regard as unjust, then um, your services are worth less and fewer clients are going to come to you. So lawyers are going to be paid less. Um, no. So what? Uh, my suggestion is, um, sorry, one second. My suggestion is when you realize this, you should put less weight on the accepted ethical rules in the legal profession. The fact that devil's advocacy is widely accepted in the legal profession shouldn't carry much weight. You should be willing to um, go against the conventional view because the conventional ethical rules appear to be uh, biased in favor of the interests of lawyers. Okay, so that's all that I have. And uh, I think we're, we're going to have a question and answer session. Thanks so much. That was uh, very, uh, very informative and thought-provoking. Uh, I mean, uh, as I said when we were setting this up, it's one thing we didn't really talk about a whole lot when I was in law school. Um, if you have questions, uh, the audience, uh, you can ask questions in the Q&A box in the bottom left of the screen. Uh, we've got a few uh, lined up here already. Uh, Joseph asks, on the flip side of all this, if someone isn't guilty, but he looks really guilty, and the lawyers think that he's uh, approaching think he's guilty, it results in, in him not getting a good defense because of preconceived notions. Uh, and so there's, there's problems on both sides of the issue. How do you reconcile that? Uh, so I'm not sure if I understood what the problem was or um, how this was different from the issue I addressed earlier. So, I mean, is the, is the issue just, um, there might be somebody who initially appears guilty and then, but he's not guilty and then he can't get a defense attorney? Uh, correct, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so first, um, you know, we should, we should be clear that our goal is not to design a legal system in which um, no innocent person can ever be convicted. Right, because the only way of doing that is um, to have no, to have no one ever be punished at all. Um, so we have to accept some risk of people being, of innocent people being convicted. Okay, 
Um, and we've decided that it's okay to convict somebody when their guilt is proved beyond a reasonable doubt, but not beyond a shadow of a doubt. Whatever exactly reasonable doubt means, right? So there could be some probability that you're innocent, you still get convicted. Um, and now my claim is that if um, you literally can't find a defense attorney who is willing in good conscience to defend you, um, then the probability of your being guilty given that is much higher than the probability of your being guilty just given that a jury judges that your guilt was proved beyond a reasonable doubt. The reason I say this is that I think defense attorneys are strongly biased in favor of defendants, more so than jury members. Um, and remember, you know, you only have to be able to get one defense attorney who's willing to represent you, right? So if you really can't get anyone to represent you because you so much appear guilty, then the probability that you're that you're actually guilty is so high that it's okay for you to just be convicted. That's uh, I I think that's a good answer. I mean, certainly there are a lot of places in the system where it's just never going to be perfect and you're, you're never going to get a perfect result. So we've got to go with what we can get. Uh, Randy asks, a jury is not asked to find the defendant guilty or innocent, but they only decide if the state has proven guilt. So if we assume that the court or jury is fully instructed regarding, one, the duty of the prosecutor to prove every element of his case beyond a reasonable doubt, and two, that the duty of the defense attorney includes challenging every element of the state's case, but does not include producing any evidence, then who is being lied to if each side does its job? Well, so suppose that the, um, suppose the defense attorney knows that the person is guilty. Uh, well, he may or may not be lying. He's not supposed to outright lie, so he's not supposed to say things facts that he knows are false. Um, but um, he is allowed to intentionally mislead. So the defense attorney might be intentionally misleading the jury, namely trying to get the jury to infer um, that the person didn't do it. Okay, now you might say, um, <laughs> no, he's not trying to get the jury to believe the defendant didn't do it. He's just trying to get the jury to believe that the state didn't prove that he did it. Um, Okay, but I think this is sort of like making a fine um, <laughs> distinction that sort of doesn't really matter. So here's another example that I have. Um, you know, let's say, okay, so you're you're in the break room and one of the employees uh, thinks that John stole his donuts. Okay, um, and you know it's because John has this uh, sugar powder on his face and the donuts have disappeared from the break room. And okay, and suppose you say. Oh, leave John alone. You know, there's no reason to think um, that he stole your donuts. You know, just because maybe he had his own donuts. That's perfectly reasonable, right? Okay. But suppose that, in fact, you know for certain that he did steal the donut because you saw him steal the donuts. Okay. And now you say, but look, I wasn't trying to mislead anyone, you know, because I, I was just trying to convince the, the other person truthfully that he didn't know that John had stolen the donuts. It's true, he doesn't know it, right? But, you know, I think that excuse wouldn't really work, right? That I think we would consider that to be deceptive, right? If you know the truth, you know, you shouldn't just say, well, they, you don't know, right? You don't know that he did it if you actually know that he did it. So, if disapproval of unjust advocacy became a dominant ethic in the legal community, wouldn't that create a market that rewards lawyers with loose morals, uh, causing kind of a situation of perverse incentives? And insert a lawyer joke here as necessary. Yeah. Okay, so here's, uh, I have some good lawyer jokes. So what's the difference between a lawyer and a catfish? Well, so one of them is a scum-sucking bottom feeder and the other one is a fish. Okay, that's my lawyer joke. Um, yeah, in answer to your question, um, I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to say, and how would that be different from the status quo? So, I mean, look, <coughs> um, like how, so I think the suggestion was, <coughs> um, if it becomes accepted that the lawyer should never advocate for something that he regards as unjust, 
we're going to get a bunch of lawyers who have uh, very loose interpretations of what's just or unjust, or maybe very idiosyncratic interpretations, like people who think that it's always just for people to go free or whatever. Okay, but I'm not sure that it's any better to have a bunch of lawyers who have strict interpretations of justice, but they think that it's fine to just pursue injustice, right? Like, why is that better, right? I mean, it seems like maybe the second group of people is even more unethical, right? Yeah, I, I can see that argument. So, as a lawyer, if I have a client who I know is guilty of, say, petty theft, would the injustice of the advocacy possibly be outweighed by the moral good of making the prosecutor look stupid in court? By being right. Um, well, <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure why that's a moral good. Uh, you might say, well, just assume that the prosecutor is stupid. It would be good for. <laughs> well. Um, I mean, if the like if this is a really bad prosecutor and somehow you're going to get him fired, then maybe. But that seems really unlikely, right? Um, so what's likely is maybe you can embarrass him this time, but it's not going to affect any other cases, right? So I don't really see that a, a good is going to be achieved. So one of the problems with legal representation is that you know even in cases where the person's not guilty. The lawyer doesn't have the relevant details at the time he takes the case. And people are often dishonest to lawyers uh, for various reasons. Sometimes they're ashamed of what the truth is. Even if it's not something that's unjust, uh, a lot of times clients, are, are they lie to their lawyers and it's dumb and they shouldn't do it, but they do. So by the time I find that my client is guilty in a case, it might be too late for them to find alternative representation. Yeah. Is it fair at that point to walk away? Well, so this is why you have to tell the lawyer, you have to tell the client at the beginning that you will refuse to advocate for anything that you regard as unjust. Uh, and then at that point, you can, um, you can say, well, I'm not going to, I don't know, you probably shouldn't just withdraw from the case entirely. But you might say, you know, I'm not going to put this witness on because I think the witness will be lying or, you know, I'm not going to say that I don't think you're guilty. Um, now, whether you should actually say in court, I think that he's guilty, I'm not sure. Um, maybe you should. Um, so, given that uh, in the current set of uh, legal ethics as uh, enforced by state bars, uh, doing something like saying in court that uh, your client is guilty would be something that could get you disbarred. Uh, how, how should practicing lawyers approach this idea if they buy your argument? Yeah, well, um, uh, it's, <coughs> it's probably too much to ask the lawyer to get himself disbarred and thus end his career, um, you know, to prevent an injustice in a particular case. Um, I don't know, you know, unless it's a really important case. Um, so it might be that the lawyer should just draw from the case at that point. Um, and that might result in a mistrial or something. So uh, you can refuse to participate without actually, um, you know, explicitly sabotaging the case. I think that's permissible. Um, so say we accept the argument that unjust advocacy is a moral evil similar to being an accessory after the fact. But you said that you know, as a matter of public policy, it's not a good idea to outlaw it because, uh, because of what it would do to lawyers and the position it would put them in relative to the state. So would it not be better to make it illegal, but to set the burden of proof so high as to make it all but impossible to prosecute something like where they can produce a recording where the lawyer is talking about how he, he knows that they're guilty, something like that? Um, I don't know. So, uh, so it sounds like this would involve um, introducing a higher standard of proof than you know, any that's used in any currently existing trial. Um, 
yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, I guess, um, I guess I don't particularly uh, we, have it. Yeah. One way you could think about it would be to use, uh, you know, the current <laughs> the highest standard of proof for those who don't know is uh, uh, the reasonable doubt standard. Um, yeah. So one way to do that is to limit the types of evidence that can be introduced um, through the evidence rules. Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, usually that's that's done the opposite way to make it easier to get convictions in certain types of cases. But I suppose it could probably be done. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's an interesting um, question. I, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't have objections to that offhand, but I'm not sure that there's a significant benefit for that. So like, if you make the burden of proof strict enough, then there just won't be any conviction, so there won't really be any point to the law. Oh. All right. Well, yeah, I, th I think that's reasonable. So um, Joseph asks, he says, to me it sounds like there's very little benefit to changing the system as the outcome is similar either way. So why bother? Well, so it's not really that I'm proposing to change the system. I'm making a claim about individual ethics. So if you yourself are a lawyer, um, what is the ethical way for you to behave, right, when you're faced with a case where, you know, somebody wants you to advocate for injustice? Um, <clears throat> So I'm not really, like, I'm not proposing that the government do anything. I'm just talking about what a, what a particular individual should do. Um, and, you know, what's the point of that? Well, you know, just you don't want to be a bad person, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, as an individual, you might have a, a concern for not acting unethically and not contributing to injustice. Um, and, you know, by the way, you might think, and maybe this is part of what's behind the question, you might think, um, I'm not really going to make a significant difference to the amount of injustice in the world because like if I refuse to represent some client, he's just going to get somebody else who's going to represent him and advocate for the injustice and, uh, you know, they'll probably be about as good. Uh, but I do think that there's a there's something to be said for refusing to contribute to the injustice, even if somebody else is then going to do it. Um, so you really shouldn't make yourself the agent um, who brings about the unjust outcome. Uh, Mark asks, isn't there almost always some uncertainty about whether a client is guilty? A defense attorney is hired to find the best evidence for his client's innocence. What could be wrong with presenting the best evidence that's found? The best evidence found by someone whose job was to search for such evidence is very weak, then I would expect that it would even reduce the uncertainty of guilt in the mind of the jurors and judge. Well, very few people will reason that way, right? Um, so. You know, um, when somebody gives you an argument for X, it's extremely rare for somebody to then lower their degree of belief in X. Um, now, if people were perfectly rational, that would happen fairly frequently. Um, you know, when somebody gives you an argument for X, you would say, you know, that argument is um, uh, weaker than I was expecting you to give. So now I have lowered my credence, but uh, that almost never happens. <laughs> um, uh, what could be wrong with presenting the best evidence that's found? Well, so um, I don't think that what lawyers do is merely presenting information, right? I think they're sort of like trying to get, they're trying to influence the, the jury or the judge to decide in a particular way. They're trying to influence them however they can. Um, you know, one thing that they'll do is try during the jury selection process, try to get jurors who they think are favorable to them. So you know, look at the demographic characteristics of the jurors and try to prove, try to get the ones on there that they think are better. Um, they'll try to appeal to the emotions of the jury and um, biases. Uh, they, they might present arguments that they don't actually think are sound, but that they think the hearer might think are sound, right? They might commit fallacies that they think will take in um, the jury or the judge. <laughs> so, um, if you're just presenting factual evidence, um, you know, maybe that's not unethical. Um, I mean, I'm not sure. Like, you can simply present correct facts and thereby cause somebody to make a false inference, right? 
Um, so I think that can, in fact, be unethical. So much of what defense attorneys do is, uh, by whatever means, they're trying to craft a narrative in which they're, uh, in which the the state's narrative of guilt uh, sounds less plausible than something else, uh, or it may be a vague bunch of something else's, uh, a bunch of other possibilities of what could have been going on, but they're trying to introduce that doubt into the scenario. And I think that if the lawyer doesn't have doubt, trying to induce others to doubt it so that a guilty person can go free is probably morally problematic. Yeah. I, yeah, it does seem disingenuous, right? It seems dishonest. Um, you know, and, and I sort of emphasize again the point that dishonesty is not just saying things that you know to be false. Um, you know, it can also be inducing people to make false inferences, even though what you said was literally true. Uh, another interesting question for Mark here, though. Uh, is it presenting something that's unsound as if it's a legitimate ar argument itself unethical? I, and I think the inference is, here is, like, even if it's, you know, while defending someone who is not guilty or who is guilty of something that shouldn't be a crime. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, I don't think that that's widely accepted as being like an ethical breach on the part of a lawyer, but I think that it's an ethical breach. Um, that is, in general, um, presenting an argument that you know is unsound, as if it were sound, and hoping that uh, people will accept it, um, that seems to be unethical. However, uh, it's not always unethical. So um, um, just as lying is not always unethical, right? So uh, it, can be, it can be permissible to lie in order to prevent an injustice, right? Um, so um, you know, here's an example. Let's say um, there's somebody who is on trial for drug possession. And my view is that drug possession is perfectly acceptable and no one should be punished for it, OK? Uh, let's say that I know that the defendant is guilty because, you know, I was with him while he was smoking the dope. And so then I'm called to the witness stand. And I'm asked to to answer whether I saw him smoking dope. And I did. Uh, I think it's perfectly acceptable for me to lie. In fact, it might be obligatory. I should say, nope, he was not using that. You know, I never saw him with the marijuana or whatever it was. Um, and I think the same is true for a lawyer. It would be permissible for a lawyer to lie in order to prevent an unjust outcome, but it's not permissible to lie or otherwise deceive people in order to bring about an unjust outcome. So if you know that uh, your client is absolutely not guilty, is it permissible to, uh, to lie just carte blanche to get them off? I think it is, yeah. Look, so here's an example that I use in another context, right? Let's say uh, you're walking down the street with one of your flamboyantly dressed friends, and you run into this gang of gay bashing hoodlums, right? And they ask you if your friend is gay. OK, and suppose you know the context is such that you believe that if you answer yes, they're going to beat him up. Okay, so you can either say, yes, he's gay, no, he's not, or you could refuse to answer. Uh, suppose that, in fact, he is gay and you know that. What should you do? Okay, this is not an ethical dilemma, right? Obviously, you should just lie. You just say no. Right? Uh, he's not actually, you know, he has three girlfriends and six children, whatever, <laughs> whatever you want. Um, so um, it's permissible to lie to someone who is about to perpetrate an injustice, that is, if the person that you're lying to is someone who would use a truthful answer as a pretext for visiting serious unjust harm on another person, then it's perfectly acceptable to lie to that person. Uh, and particularly given that that person actually doesn't have a right to know the truth, right? Like the hoodlums have no right to know about other people's sexual orientation. Uh, similarly, I think that if the state is asking you whether somebody so, you know, going back to my drug use example, the state is asking you if somebody used drugs. Um, they don't have any right to know that. And if you truthfully tell them that the person used drugs, then they're going to use that as a pretext for visiting serious unjust harm on that person. So it's totally acceptable to lie to them. 
Um, and I, I should think for a lawyer as well as for a witness. I, uh, I think I agree, which uh, this is going to make uh, talking to some of my lawyer friends interesting for the next few months, maybe. We've got some, yeah. uh, got some stuff to uh, hash out at the bar. Yeah. But, well, this has been excellent. I, we've run out of questions here. Thank you for, for presenting tonight. It's really great presentation. Really, thank you. just novel stuff. Haven't heard it anywhere else, and I, I'm glad I heard it here. So thanks, everyone, for coming, and hope you have a great night. Great. Thank you, and thanks for the good questions. Uh, Take care, everyone. Thanks.